Saxon Algebra 1, Lesson 84. We got a two topicer today. And the first topic is we're going to learn how to multiply radicals. It's pretty easy and it's pretty fun. Let's just pretend that these radicals we want to multiply are called M and N. I know, they're letters, why aren't they numbers? That's because when we're trying to establish a general rule in math, we go to letters to sort of substitute for any universal number, right? It just makes them kind of generic um, so that we can focus on the rule instead of the numbers. You know the story of the three little pigs? The three little pigs, I, I assume they were brothers. We don't really ever know that. But what happens is they go out and, into the world and they each build themselves a house. One of straw, one of sticks, and one of bricks, I believe, is the way the story goes. But, unfortunately, they have an uh, adversary named the Big Bad Wolf, and he comes and starts blowing down the houses from the flimsiest of materials, and he slowly works his way up to the strongest. As each little pig gets his house blown down, he runs off and joins one of his brothers in his sturdier house. So to me, the way to multiply radicals is to invoke the spirit of the three little pigs. And remember, they can share houses or they can separate into their own houses. I call these shapes pig houses in my mind. It makes it very, very, very straightforward and easy to remember. Let's try an example. Okay, we're multiplying four times the square root of three times three times the square root of two. Okay, well, wait a minute. This doesn't look like this because this has numbers on the outside. These numbers on the outside are the big bad wolves trying to get in. The numbers on the inside are the little pink piggies safe and warm inside. So when we multiply, we multiply wolf to wolf and pig to pig. That is the rule I want it in your brain for the rest of your life. You will remember it like this. We multiply the wolves and we get 12. We multiply the pigs and we get six, right? Four times three is 12. Three times two is six. This is our final answer. Whoa, it's that easy. Wolf to wolf, pig to pig. Let's try another one. Okay, so let's multiply our wolves. Four times six is 24. And then our pigs, three times six is 18. But now we have a new situation. We have a root, a pig, that can be reduced, right? We know this because if we take the prime factors of this, which I will do, this is two times nine, whoops, I jumped ahead in my brain. Two times nine, nine can be broken down into three times three. That means that this is equal to, we can rewrite this answer as 24 times the square root of two times three times three, right? Because 18 can be broken down into those factors. Now, we have another rule that I need to help you remember. Besides wolf to wolf and pig to pig, the other rule is two pigs on the inside of the house equals one pig on the outside. Two pigs And later I'll show you mathematically why this is true. But for now, I just want you to remember the rule.
Make sure you get this copied well into your notes. These rules are going to stay with us for a long, long time. So what that means is these two, three pigs that match, they have to match, obviously, um, can come out of the house, but there's only one of them on the outside, and we multiply him by the wolf that's already out there. Somehow coming out of the house, I mean, I could build my metaphor that two pigs come together and they can fight the wolf. I don't know. They turn into a wolf. I don't know. Um, but two pigs in the house equals one pig out of the house. We multiply. This becomes 72. And then inside the house, all we have left is two. This is the simplified answer to our problem. Pretty cool, right? Notice up here, we could have said, well, wait, why didn't we simplify this answer? Well, this breaks down into two times three. Again, in order to simplify what's in a radical, break it down into its prime factor so you can see. Um, there's no, there are no pigs to take out because there's no pairs of pigs. So that's why this was the final answer here. And we didn't even talk about it. Here, when your brain gets used to this, you'll go, oh, look, this is nine times something. Nine is a perfect square. It's a pair of threes. Therefore, I know I can take them out. So we look for those perfect squares in our numbers, okay? Um, and if you're not sure, you can just do a prime factor tree of the number inside the pig house, and you'll be able to figure it out. Okay, let's bump it up another notch. Hey, I got a new notebook. Remember last time I filled the notebook? It didn't have any orange books, so I went for pure, pristine white for Algebra 1. Sorry, I'm thrashing around. Here we are. Put myself back in camera. P.S. I forgot to do this last time. Look. This is the last lesson for week 22, and I want you to notice there are only three weeks of new lessons left before we get to the midterm and then spring break. All right, so three more weeks of new lessons before we get to the final. Ooh, exciting. Okay, we're on our third example. And how many are there? Let me check. Oh, we're doing four of these and then we're switching topics. What? Okay, 84.3. This time, it's not just a simple multiplication problem. This time we're doing distribution. Well, distribution is just two multiplication problems in one, right? We'll multiply this one and then this one. It works exactly the same. So here we go, wolf to wolf, 20, pig to pig, six. We can see that's three times two. We know those are the prime factors of six. We know that doesn't give us any matching pigs. So that's done. Now we'll go this way, wolf to wolf is 24. And we, we keep the plus sign in here, just like normal, 24. Now look what happens. Maybe we don't notice that these match and we go, oh, it's square root of nine. And then we go, wait, nine is three times three. So now I can take a pig out of the house and multiply it here, okay? That's one way we could do this. And then that would be 20 square root of six plus 72. That's one way to get the answer. The other way, after we did the first one, 20 square root of six, as we're multiplying it, we get the 24. We could see right away, oh look, that's gonna be two threes, so that's gonna be two three pigs in the house. I can take one out. You can just skip right over this step if your brain catches it. If your brain doesn't catch it, that's fine. You'll catch it later. But if you do notice right away, oh, look, that's going to give me two, three pigs in the house, and I can take them, I can take one of them out right away, go ahead and do it. So then again, we get the same answer. 20 square root of 6 plus 72. Either way is fine. As you do more and more of these, your brain will tend toward this. You'll tend to catch it earlier. But it's okay if it doesn't, don't worry about that. 84.4, this is the last of these problems. 
Simplify. 4 square root of 2 All right, it's another distribution. The wolves are 12. The pigs, I'm gonna pretend I don't notice that those are matching pigs, and I'll do square root of four plus, now this is only a wolf, so it's just the wolf to wolf 20, square root of two, beautiful. But then I notice, oh, this is a perfect square, isn't it? It's two times two, I make my little prime factor tree. You can do it in your head too. Um, and so I'm gonna take these two pigs out. And there'll be one pig out of the house. Two pigs in the house equals one pig out of the house. This now completely goes away and I get 24 plus 20 times the square root of two. That's my final answer. Yay. So my friends, that's how we multiply radicals. It's so cool, right? It's all about the three little pigs. All right, are you ready? John's gonna turn this already significant lesson into a monster beast by saying, hey, let's talk some more about functions. Okay. A function, as we have seen, is nothing much more than an equation. But if you want to get theoretical and fancy, functions are a mapping or a connection. A mapping, that's the, that's the word mathematicians love. between inputs, which are called the domain, A function is a mapping or a connection between the inputs to exactly one member of the outputs. What in the name of heaven am I talking about? Let's take a really simple example that we've worked with in the past. Oh wait, pretend I didn't write that there yet. I don't wanna add those words yet. We know that in something like this, you can take any numbers you want for x. Let's take one. You do the work and you get the answer. And you can pick any numbers you want. You just plug them in and do the math, right? Let's do three. Three plus two is five, right? We've done this and then we've graphed the pairs, right? What we're saying is you can look at this very same exercise and give each column a different name. This, these are the inputs. You can call them the domain if you want. These are the outputs. You can call this the range if you want. And this is the part that we call the function. It's like the equation, okay? And what the whole idea of a function is about, that gets mathematicians so worked up, is that every time we take one of these inputs, let's say one, every time you take one and plug it into this specific function, you will always get the same output. You're never gonna plug one into this function and get seven. It's one plus two, it's always gonna be three. And that's the mapping that they're talking about, that one and three are connected by this function. I mean, kind of, it's just fancy names for what we've already done, right? Remember this, sometimes we also call this the input, and there are more fancy names for this, we'll learn. And this is the output. It's just another name for the same thing, right? So 
this relationship between one and three, that they're always gonna go together when we're looking at this function, it's obvious, we know that, but we're giving fancy words to it and making a big stressy deal out of it as if it was new, all right? Um, and John draws this same scenario somewhat differently. He draws it with shapes, which I kind of appreciate. This side is the domain, and he's using a different function in his function machine. He says, instead of just x plus two, mine was easier. He said, let's do x squared plus five. He chooses these values for x. He puts an x right there, and then he writes function, just like I did. And then over here he writes y. This looks an awful lot like this, doesn't it? It's just slightly different shapes. And then he calculates the values. And he doesn't leave room to work, which annoys me, but that's okay. If we plug two into this, we'll get two squared, that's four, plus five is nine. So two and five uh, represent that mapping, that connection that we see. Four, four squared is 16, plus five more is 21. 4 and 21 are a pair, we, we can say that they're images of each other. 2 is an image of 9, 9 is an image of 2. They go together. Okay, 7, 49, plus 5 more is 54. Okay, so this is John's example that he wants to show to us. And he makes the point that 2 will always connect to 9 and four will always connect to 21, and seven will always connect to 54. Just like we found here, right? I could draw the same kind of arrows. These guys are always gonna be connected, right? They're the mapping. Okay, so now what John's gonna do, is gonna show us some pictures like this, and he's gonna show us that just by looking at diagrams like this, we can tell if a number is a function or not. Remember that, each input has to be connected to exactly one of the outputs, just like our arrows show here, right? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're not gonna look so much at the function part of it. We're just gonna look at the relationship of inputs to outputs, the relationship of domain to range, same difference. And we're gonna look and see if this rule has been met. Each input is connected to one and exactly one member of the outputs, right? We didn't say sometimes one is three and sometimes one is zero. No, that's ridiculous. One is always three. So, let's look at the pictures John draws and learn this new way he has of asking the question. 84.5, and I'm just gonna draw them all for you. They're in your book. See what he's doing is now he's just showing us the inputs and the outputs, the domain and the range. We're not talking about the function itself. We're just looking at this mapping relationship. So we don't know what the function is. John just draws this much for us. So what he's saying, and he tells us this is the domain and this is the range, which is exactly what we would expect. Okay, so what he's saying is that for every member in, of the inputs in the domain, they connect across and they each have a matching image in the outputs. That is exactly what a function is. And John's asking us, does the diagram designate a function? Yes, because each input has one and only one corresponding output. So this is a yes. This is a function. Okay, now some students get frustrated because they're like, but how? How does four connect to seven and five connect to two and six connect to 14? How, what's the equation that would make that work? We don't care about that right now. We don't care about the function itself. We're just looking at the domain and the range to see if they're behaving like numbers in a function should behave. That's all we care about. We don't care about how we calculate these pairs. We're just saying, okay, somehow 
somebody got an equation to make this work. Does it look right to us? Hey, 4.6, I thought it was five. Um, here comes another one. Now John's getting a little crazy because he's using letters. Oh my gosh, John. It seems harder, but here's the thing. We don't really care how these things get matched or imaged or connected together. We just care that they do it in the proper way. That's all John's asking. He says that Y is connected to P. Okay, that looks good. And he says that A is connected to X. Perfect, lovely. M is a little more complicated. He's got a letter going, an arrow going up here, and he's got one going here. So what he's saying is that Y always connects to P, A always connects to X, M sometimes connects to X, and sometimes connects to five. No, 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 no. That is not gonna work. M can only have one image. So this is not a function. And it's all because of this problem right here. M has two images, is the way we can say that, right? X and five. That is the deal breaker. Mr. Yuck. Okay, that's why this is not a function. M is trying to have it both ways and it can't. All right, beautiful. Let's go on to the next one. All right, does this diagram designate a function? Again, we're not looking at the function itself, we're just looking at the relationship between the inputs and the outputs, the domain and the range. This is a tricky one. A connects with five. Four connects with five. 7 connects with 11. Again, this is the domain and this is the range, if you'd like. If that makes you feel better, I want to um, normalize these words in your vocabulary, right? Okay, A always connects with 5, 4 always connects with 5, 7 always connects with 11. That sounds good. Each one of these always connects with one and only one member of the outputs. Does it matter? that A and four both connect with five? No, it does not. We don't care if there's repetition here. We only care that each member of the out, each input, I'm gonna write this down. Each input connects with or maps to, if you want to use the most mathy terminology, it maps to or it images with one and only one output. And that's what's happening here. The fact that some of these are doubling up is not our problem. So yes, this is a function. We have a bunch of these, we're going up to 12. Now this one looks different and it's kind of confusing. I don't like this kind as much.
Again, this is the domain and this is the range. Inputs and outputs. Every one of these has to map to exactly one over here. Now, this one, we're using a completely different way of describing what's going on here. We're saying that this is the function, this is the equation that we're using to link the inputs to the outputs. This is the same one I used in the beginning, isn't it? X plus two. And this time, we're not listing specific members of the inputs, we're saying any real number. The rules of this game are that any real number can be plugged into there, which makes sense, right? There's, there's no numbers you couldn't put in there. And then this is just an empty spot. Now, this is confusing because it doesn't seem like we're linking this to this at all. But the function this time serves to describe. The function will tell us how to map each one of these to this. So we say, and it's confusing, I don't like this one at all. We say, yes, this is a valid way to write a function. Because even though we haven't written any outputs, the function itself will help us make that connection or mapping to link them. So if you see something written in this style, take a note, yes, that is a legitimate way to write a function, okay? Seems weird, but it's fine. Okay, now let's try another way of looking at numbers to decide whether or not they're a function. Okay, that was by looking at circle diagrams. That's what I call those last ones. Now we're going to look at ordered pairs. Does either of the sets of ordered pairs shown below designate a function? Okay, and there's an A and a B. Oh, John. Now, imagine that we took four and seven and we wrote them in a set of parentheses with a comma in between them. Imagine we wrote five and two as another ordered pair and six and 14 as another ordered pair. That's what we're doing here. We could, if we wanted, we could write these as a diagram and we would write four, whoops, I don't want that arrow there. Here, I'll put it like this. Four goes to six, seven goes to two. But look, now we're saying, oh look, four also goes to five. Right? So that's a problem. Four does not map to one and only one output. It's mapping to two different outputs. So we know this is not a function. It fails the test. However, without going to all the extra work of drawing that diagram, let me cover it up. Here's how we can look at it. Look at just the inputs or the X values of each of your pairs. See if any repeat. Aha, we do, we have a pair of fours. Once you notice that the first element repeats, look at the second element. It should be the same. If it's the same, then it would be fine, right? If this said four and six and four and six, that would be fine. But because our second value is different, that's how we know it's not a function. B. Okay, as we look at this one, Again, look at the inputs first, the X values. See if you have any repeats. We do not, so we're done. That's a yes. It's fine. These are all the right answers though. I have not. I have been dropping the smiley face ball, haven't I? All right, example 8410 has Four of these. Which of the following ordered sets, or which of the following sets of ordered pairs are functions? Okay, so we're going to use this rule. First, look at the inputs, see if you have any repeats. If you do repeat, they should have the same output paired with them. If it's a different number, no, failure. Okay, here's A. I'll write them down. And you know what, if you're at all, you don't have to write these down in your homework, but if you're at all confused or overwhelmed by these, 
Writing them down helps you notice the numbers. This is a one. The second one starts with a two. The third one starts with a three. The fourth one starts with a four. Okay, so there's no repeat X numbers, so that's automatically a yes. I'm gonna write it here. B. One, two, two, three. Okay, here comes trouble. There's another one. I already had a one. This one's paired with a two. This one's paired with a three. Don't even have to finish writing it down. That is not gonna work, people, right? The inputs match, but they're paired with different outputs. Deal breaker. C. One, four, three, two, two, okay, four, two, those are different. Here comes another four. I hold my breath. Oh, it's paired with three again. So that's cool, the, the inputs match, but the outputs do too, so that makes me comfortable. And then the last one is three, three, okay? The fact that we're getting repetition among the outputs, I don't care at all about that. That doesn't matter to me at all. It's only when we repeat the inputs that we have to double check and make sure the outputs match. This one's good. And the last one, D. One and minus one. Four. Minus one. Okay, again, we look at the inputs only and look for any repeats. They're all different. So this should be fine. Now, again, some students will look at all those outputs and go, dude, look at there's a whole bunch of minus ones and they're all connected to different numbers, X's. That's fine, we don't care. It's not about repetition in the range, it's about repetition in the domain, right? The X's. If we see repeats there, like these fours, that's what we care about. That's when we have to take a closer look. All right, so here's the pattern. Yes, B is no, C is yes, D is yes. Yay, we got them all right. Function notation sometimes freaks students out, but I like it because there isn't a lot of calculation. It gives our brains a little break. Does the diagram designate a function? Seven maps to 11, six maps to four, but also to eight, uh-oh, six. No, you can't do that. You only get to map to one of the range. So no, you fail. I'm just unhappy with you. Guess what? Finally, last one. Does the diagram designate a function or a relation? Okay, let me tell you what the difference is. Notice that these functions that we've been looking at in these diagrams, they're nutty. I have no idea what equation would let six connect to 11, or seven to 11, it would map those two, but then it would map six with four or eight. No, it doesn't make any sense. So we're not worrying about that, that though. We're just looking at the pairs of numbers. And here we have six maps with four, seven maps with 11, and five is just sitting there. So is this a function? No, because remember, to be a function, every member of the input needs to be mapped with or connected to one and only one member of the outputs. Five is a loner. 
and he doesn't have anyone. All right, but John's asking us a second question. Is this something called a relation? What is a relation? It must have A relation is kind of like a broader category than a function. A relation would include situations like this, where six has two images, not just one. So we know it fails the function test, but at least it's called a relation because six does have a buddy. Five has no one. So five is not a relation either. This one, we could say, is it a relation? Yes. Because everybody's got a partner one way or the other, at least one. Poor little five is no one, so he doesn't have that. John didn't ask us if this one was a relation. He just introduced that idea down here. But this is a good example of what a relation does look like. So that's why I added that little tidbit. This is the fancy definition of a relation. This is a picture of what a relation looks like or can look like. Okay, guess what? I'm done. Let me just show you in the practice. You're gonna multiply some wolves and pigs. Here are some of these diagrams. Then they're asking about domain and range. Remember domain is inputs, range is outputs. X's and Y's, that's another way of breaking them up. Um, we're gonna learn more names later, but domain just means the inputs and range means the outputs. And then here are some where we look at the pairs, which is the same information as this, just arrayed in a different shape. And then you have your problem set. Yay. Okay, we did it. We finished. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>